Hi, I'm Chris Howard, Chief of Research for Gartner. Welcome to Top of Mind. Yeah, I'm going to keep talking about artificial intelligence, but I'm going to take it in a slightly different direction, maybe than we've been in the last uh, four episodes. I've been spending a fair amount of time thinking about thinking, uh, because so much of what interests us with the emergence of generative AI and AI overall is that it appears to think. So I wanted to really dig into that a little bit and, and tease that apart. In the first episode, I talked about the uncanny valley. The uncanny valley is a concept where we as people become either unnerved or attracted to a technology because it appears to be like us. It appears to be human-like. What I would argue is happening is there's some of that, but actually what's emerging is a different kind of intelligence, a machine intelligence that appears at first to be like human intelligence, but is actually likely to evolve on a different path. So artificial intelligence is a bit of a problematic term for people because, again, they have this reaction. Is it, is, it, is it like me? Is it going to overtake us as humans? There's all kinds of thoughts across an entire spectrum there from very positive and optimistic to quite afraid and dystopian. I fall somewhere kind of into the middle of that because I understand more about how it works. You think about artificial intelligence and generative AI really is a combination of two things, is a combination of a type of computing that mimics the way that the brain works, and a lot of advances in natural language processing. And what that results in is the ability to have a conversation with this kind of technology that appears very human-like, but it's because of the way that that is built. There's another interesting concept here that I want to think about too, which is called a consensual domain. Okay, fan fancy word. What's that really mean? Consensual domain essentially is the space that we share when we're talking to each other. And so we're engaged in conversation. We have shared objectives. We have shared goals. And we're functioning kind of as a unit, kind of responding to each other and so on. And generative AI, and specifically chat, GPT, and the chat types of, of models create that kind of a space where we're actually conversing with it and seeming to share goals and to work through problems together. This idea of the consensual domain is actually a very important part of how this technology will be applied. Uh, I've said often that AI, and especially generative AI, generative AI becomes a partner in the solution of difficult problems, where you need to be very creative or innovative, or you need information sort of immediately in a consumable form. It's functioning as an agent or as an, um, an advisor, perhaps, but it's, it is certainly in partnership with us as humans in working together on difficult problems. Something I'm talking with clients a lot about these days is the difference between generative AI, which is sort of taking all the attention, and just regular AI. Uh, and also just regular computing. I mean, there's this whole spectrum of ways to solve problems and to write code and so on, and they're applied to different things. But generative AI essentially is an application of artificial intelligence techniques. So natural language, for example, deep neural networking, these types of things that have been around before for, for years, actually, and then coming to life in the form of generative AI. Generative AI, as we've talked about, really is a, an application where you need to have a distillation of knowledge or you want creative ideas in the midst of working on a problem, for example, is generating stuff. Not all AI generates things. Generative AI, of course, given the name, that's what it does. So you would tend to use it for use cases where that's the kind of help that you need. There are lots of other ways to use machine learning and artificial intelligence as a set of technologies to solve a whole range of problems. And so what we're seeing clients do right now is looking at, well, where do I apply Gen AI? Where do I apply AI? Where do I simply do predictive analytics? And apply each of these, perhaps in conjunction with one another. This is the nature of the trough of disillusionment that I talked about in the last episode, where you start to realize that it's hard and it maybe doesn't solve all of the problems that you thought it did. It's not magic. It actually takes a lot of work. And this is where we are right now is in this application. And many of the clients that I'm talking to are starting to experiment and to pilot and implement using prompt engineering, which we've talked about before as well, and then learning where the boundaries of this is. But what's happening underneath here as we learn more about it and interact with it is, again, the emergence of machine intelligence. And machine intelligence comes from the fact that we've built these dynamic neural networks to function kind of like the, we believe the brain functions. And it's not so much about the storage of information as it is about the relationship between nodes in the network. 
and the strengthening of those nodes as the system learns. This is very much how the brain works as well. This is how we create memories, how we respond to situations, and it's very sophisticated. So it's not surprising then that generative AI using neural nets actually produces outcomes that feel very human. But what I'm going to position is the fact that it's actually moving towards machine intelligence, which is a different kind of intelligence. The mistake that we sometimes make is that believing AI is equivalent to human intelligence. In many ways, it's it's smarter. It has the ability to ingest more information. In a lot of ways, it's just not the same in terms of empathy and things like that. So this is where we see it going. So still thinking about thinking, let's think about frogs. Uh, So the frog retina has been an object of study, like so many things, and you find something interesting there that really does relate to what I'm talking about here. You imagine that the retina receives light, and then that creates signals in the brain, and then the brain computes it, and then understands what's going on, and then perhaps creates some kind of reaction. Well, what scientists discovered back in the 70s with frog retinas is that it was actually there, uh, there was a way that the retina could be stimulated that actually produced a pattern. It was super responsive to a black dot on a light surface. And of course, that is what a fly looks like to a frog. And so it was immediately, that's food. So it was very programmed in. But what what they discovered is that it didn't have to go to the brain for that processing. It was actually built into the visual system. Not everything is, but in the case of this, it was. Actually relates to pigeons in New Zealand. So pigeons in New Zealand uh, are, are interesting because there are no snakes there. That's a really important point. And yet the pigeon retina is built to respond to an S-shaped thing on a light background. It looks like a snake. It's prey. It's dangerous. And so whenever a New Zealand pigeon sees something that looks like that, it has this flight response, even though generations of those pigeons have never seen a snake before. Okay, so why am I telling you this? The other part of AI that we're seeing applied for really great results, it's like very domain-specific, trained for very specific things. So take, for example, the use of artificial intelligence in looking at MRI scans and like millions and millions of scans and specifically trained to look for anomalies in those scans and maybe even particular types of anomalies that might be rare. And so you have this machine trained for a shortcut that is looking for very specific things and giving you immediate response. So that's not generative AI, that's just AI. It's looking for patterns and it's like shortcut to look for very specific patterns. Think about how you might use that kind of thing to look for very specific things, maybe in your financial data or in your human relationships data for your employees. All kinds of things where the ability to spot a specific anomaly could actually lead you to a better business decision. Frogs, pigeons, flies, snakes, MRIs, all examples of very specific intelligence aimed at a very specific problem. There's another kind of intelligence I want to talk about, which is swarm intelligence or collective intelligence. Think of ants building an ant farm or bees creating a hive. Each of the individuals in those swarms has a specific task, even though they may not be aware of the entire model, like the thing that they're actually doing together, and they can create very complex structures as a result. This takes us into the realm, perhaps, of robotics or nanotechnology, where we're actually using multiple agents in the solution of a difficult problem, or maybe the creation of something new. And that's a type of technology that we're seeing used more and more, for example, in factory settings or in communication settings or transportation settings and so on. Lots of different types of intelligence. And artificial intelligence, it's a bit of an unfortunate term because it kind of covers all of these things. And sometimes it looks like human intelligence. Sometimes it doesn't look at all like human intelligence. It's starting to look a lot more like machine intelligence. The capabilities of the machine to do things that humans aren't well designed to do, that machines really are well designed to do. And that's where we go from here. You've been asking great questions and giving really great feedback in the comments field. I want you to keep doing that because I look at those, my team looks at those, and we thought, let's take a few of them and answer them. So there was a great question about the use of Gen AI in strategy formation. So a quick answer to that, you know, we could go on for another half hour probably, is you think of strategy as the combination or recombination of ideas in response to something that's happening in the world. So the business needs to respond. And you're actually trying to form a new strategy in response to that. And sometimes it can be very disruptive. So I can imagine using Gen AI to actually 
give me options to say, well, what would happen if this combined with that? And then that creates a conversation space for you and your teams to say, well, what if, how would we respond to that scenario? And then you can engage with the conversational UI within Gen AI to actually assess those strategies, to give you feedback on them, to look for logic and so on. So I think it's an emerging space, one that we'll be watching really closely. A few episodes ago, I talked about the move from fascination to implementation, and some of you have asked, well, are there examples of that? Uh, there are, uh, but I would say don't feel like you're behind if you haven't found those or haven't piloted things yet. We're all kind of at the same spot. But for those companies that were working on it perhaps before the end of 22 and into this year, you're starting to see applications, for example, of looking at knowledge repositories and using it as a form of search. You're seeing clearly other types of, of Gen AI, like in the pharmaceutical industry, is being used to create perhaps new combinations for new therapeutics. I'm seeing it also in the generation of designs for hardware, for 3D printing and so on, of actually creating novel designs based on parameters. So there are examples of this out there. The interesting thing I'm seeing is that once you decide the pilot you want to stand up, it's actually very, very fast. You can get something working within days in these environments and actually start to produce results that you can react to and fine tune it and so on. The one thing I'll say though is most of these applications are internal facing for now until we actually figure out how to make the results more accurate. And at what point we would be able to expose that to an environment where accuracy is, is really refined and perhaps isn't dangerous if it isn't as accurate as it might be. Really great question about whether Gen AI will become dependent on itself. Uh, kind of a recursive problem about a recursive technology, if you understand what I mean. I think that a couple of things here. One is that uh, it'll continue to improve and it will continue to have emergent behavior that perhaps then lends itself well to the next evolution of the technology. The other thing that's happening, of course, is that's creating output that then is getting consumed into the next models which could be beneficial, or it could actually reinforce biases or things that were present in the prior models. So I do think it actually becomes part of its own development chain as we go through the next couple of years. And it's really up to us on the human and the loop side of this to make sure that it's producing results that are effective, efficient, and really accurate. So a question about algorithmic bias and algorithmic input bias. These are concepts that have been around for a while, and the use of AI requires some kind of a governance check even before it's created and thinking about what's the input going in here, what's the heritage of that information, is it the information coming in accurate enough to produce accurate results. And we've held, had algorithmic impact assessments, especially at the government level, for some time. What I think will happen in the complexity of prompt engineering, which is more detail than I could go into right now, there's actually a set of filters. There are input filters, there are output filters. So the prompt can be shaped with the information coming in and then checked as the information is coming out, which is where I think a lot of the intellectual energy will be placed in the next few months as people experience the depth of this technology still really important to check for biases, to check for accuracy, to check for the behavior of algorithms, especially in those situations where their life and death are really important decisions being made by them. And at some point, you may decide that Gen AI is not the right tool for that, but rather machine learning in its more practiced form actually produces the patterns that we can use for uh, much more responsible AI. In closing, Generative AI, ChatGPT, the things that we've been talking about for the last several months, have created a momentum, but understand that it is related to other technologies and other types of intelligence that are becoming increasingly useful in multiple settings for us as individuals, as businesses, as governments, and so on. What I'd like you to think about, though, is this idea of the consensual domain, our interaction with these technologies to accomplish results that neither one of us on our own the technology, the human could pursue. It's that relationship that we have with technology that enable us, enables us to do things that we couldn't possibly imagine. So thanks for joining us. It's been Chris Howard and Top of Mind, and we'll see you next time.